Hey guys, Raven Knight here. So today I'm going to be doing the follow-up to my video that I released recently about Lord Ramiel. In the last video, I wanted to just leave it as me reading the lore of Lord Ramiel because honestly, there are just some people out there who don't want to know my opinion on it. They just wanted to hear the lore. But this video, I'm going to be talking about my thoughts on it and I'm going to compare him to Ruth, my own created warden. So let's get started. So first of all, let me just preface this. I like Lord Ramiel's story, I just don't think it's finished. I, I think that there needed to be more to it. Let me explain what I mean. The story opens with Lord Ramiel already having taken the oath with the dragon, already having drunk the blood, already taken the immortality drink, and I feel like that started at the wrong place. What do I mean? I wanted to know, how did he approach that dragon? How did he get the Great Wyvern's attention? Why did the Great Wyvern even agree to meet with them? How did he communicate with the Great Wyvern? Can it talk? Do they talk to each other? Does he speak the language of the Wyverns? Why did the Wyvern agree to this in the first place? You know, it's it's strange to me that the Wyvern would even allow him, like, it, why should I give you anything? I could just burn you to a crisp right here. Was there some kind of war between humanity and the Wyverns and they were putting an end to it? Or did it, all we get is that by taking the oath with the Wyvern, it helped him in defeating his big enemy, a tyrant of some kind. What did the Wyvern get out of it? Like, it's some kind of oath and blood pact between the two. He took the drink, but what does the Wyvern get out of the deal? Does it mean that they'll never hunt or kill Wyverns again? Okay, but is there any guarantee the Wyverns won't hunt or kill them? Like, it's never explained. It's never exposited on why that's the case. I think it would have been a lot better to make this a four-part story and make it so that we see when he meets with the wyvern what kind of conversation they have what kind of deal is struck and then through that we understand more about why he made the sacrifice he did that makes it even heavier when we learn that uh lord ramiel has lost a lot of his empathy and his emotion he reminds me a lot of saitama and actually that's a good part of the story i like that part i like the fact that lord ramiel's kind of grown numb to other people it does beg the question, is that just the result of drinking the blood, or maybe he was always a little sociopathic and lacking in empathy? Maybe that was something that just happened over time, or maybe something that happened because he's lived so long and seen so much. When you have no fear of death, a lot of things start to numb for you. That's why Saitama doesn't feel much at all, because he has no fear of losing. He will always win, you know? Nothing excites him anymore. Fear, tension joy anger i feel none of them anymore in exchange for power maybe i've lost something that's essential for being human here you've got ramiel who's just saying i've lived through so much i've seen so much i've lived so long now I, there's not a lot of point anymore you know he starts to lose some of that empathetic resolve and i like that i think it would have been stronger though because maybe the wyvern could have warned him and said hey i'll give you my blood and it'll make you immortal but you got to realize with immortality comes a price and he and his righteousness might have said, I don't care, any price is worth saving my people. So he takes that drink. And now, maybe a century later, he's going, man, I really should have thought about this. Because it makes him weigh how important was it to save his people that he gave up a part of what made him human. That would have been really powerful. I really would have liked to see that. Then we move on to the festival. Not a lot to say about the festival. I'll say one thing about the writer who ever made the story. Their descriptive capabilities are very well done. Everything that they described was very well done. I liked that. Then we get on to the biggest twist, the cataclysm happening. Apparently, the cataclysm happened during the days of Ramiel. And I kind of like that. I think that's a creative choice. I think that's a very interesting idea. But this leads into some questions later. We'll get to them. But I thought it was cool that the cataclysm happened during the days of Ramiel. That shows how far back the wardens go, how far back these oaths go, how far back these warriors can be seen. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay. So then we see an army showing up. An army that, as the, as the story describes, looked like they were made of obsidian. Now, if you don't know, Obsidian is the same material by which the Blackstone Legion was named. So I can't help but notice, oh, are you making a little nod to the Blackstone Legion through that? Is that what that is? I don't know. I can't guarantee, but I did notice that detail. So, big old army shows up. They're riding sickly horses. Like, these look like demon, demonic forces here. 
And not only that, but there are giants with them. Now, if we're going to have great wyverns and giant world serpents for the Vikings and stuff like that, I think we can have giants, okay? Let's accept that. But what I find funny is Ramiel says he had thought that giants were just fairy tales told to children to frighten them. Hold on, dude. You've literally talked to a dragon and drank its blood, and you think giants are just fairy tales. Okay. <laughs> so, just saying, that's a little inconsistent. But the cataclysm panics everybody. The army panics everybody. Where did the army come from? Who are they? What do they want? How did they rally all these giants? Did they crawl out of hell itself? Did the cataclysm bring them? Or did they cause the cataclysm? We don't know that yet. It's not explained. All we know is that the cataclysm has happened and an army has shown up to attack Ramiel's fortress. Then Ramiel blows the horn of cinders. And when I heard that, the first thing I thought of was Dark Souls because everything in Dark Souls is about cinders. And so I'm like, come on, dude, you already look like a Dark Souls character. Why not? Yeah, you have a horn of cinders too. Now this horn of cinders is meant to summon up the warriors. And here's where we get an inconsistency. It says very clearly in the story that the horn was meant to summon the knights, the samurai, the Vikings, and the Wulin, who were all part of his legion, to come and fight. Now, that makes me take pause. So, all of these factions are already united under you. They're already together. That doesn't make sense chronolo chronologically based on what we've known so far. I thought that the samurai, at this point lived across the sea. Long ago, the samurai arrived in a land already inhabited. They were forced to live where others would not. And their island was swallowed by the cataclysm, so they traveled and eventually landed here. I thought that the Wulin lived in their own country, and they didn't show up until partway through the big war that was going on, like post-Apollyon era. What are they all doing here? Why are they all here now working under you? That doesn't make sense. There is only one way that we can excuse it. There's only one way that I think we can make this work. If the story of Lord Ramiel is a fable or legend that's passed down, it could be argued that the other factions tried to insert their ancestors into Lord Ramiel's story to create a sense of unity. Uh, my buddy Maul on uh, one of his comments said that it's possible that during the Truce of Weverndale, maybe that was something that the other factions did. The legend of Lord Ramiel was passed around and the other factions said, and we were there, our, our ancestors were there working with Lord Ramiel. That should inspire us to unity. Let's bring back those days of Lord Ramiel. That would be the only way that makes sense. But if we accept that, then that means it is fantasy. It is a legend, not true history but then again we're talking about dragons and giants and all that kind of stuff so how much truth can we take from it i ask you not entirely sure but that was a major inconsistency that i had to point out so then he rallies up and he prepares to go fight but his uh legion isn't coming yet because they're still scared until suddenly the great wyvern and all the other wyverns show up to help him because they're there to fulfill their blood pact they're there to help him again this begs the question why what do they get out of it? I get the whole idea. I'm going to make you immortal and I'll come fight for you whenever you need it. But what does the wyvern get out of it? What does the wyvern take from this blood oath? Was it the friends they made along the way? I don't know. We need to know what the great wyvern was supposed to be getting. 
I mean, I don't mind the dragon coming to help Lord Ramiel. It's cool that he does, but I need to know the terms of the and conditions here. Why would the great dragon just suddenly show up and say, here, man, I'm here to help you. Oh, crap, that's a big army. Um, Well, I, may, I guess I've made that agreement with you, and you have been giving me... What, what, were you, what was it you were supposed to be giving me again? I, I'm looking at this huge army. I'm suddenly drawing a blank. What am I getting out of this, dude? So, just saying. All right. So then because the wyvern shows up, all the military shows up, and they're ready to fight too. And then it gets this really cool scene of a dark, evil army with giants preparing to fight a good, righteous army with dragons. And that's something right out of a fairy tale. Sounds really badass. Sounds really awesome. It even ends with the line, for honor, you know, kind of drawing an end to the story. Really cool. I do like it. I do like that a lot. Now, as of right now, they haven't released any more parts of uh, Lord Ramiel's story. And maybe they will. Maybe they will. And if they do, I'll talk about it more. But right now, from the way they ended part two, it sounded like that was kind of the final note that they were going to give him. And now they're going to save the next part or whatever happened next for the next hero skin. I don't know. But whatever the case, was it good? It was serviceable. It worked for what it was, and I thought that it got the basic points down, but I feel like it's unfinished. Like I said, go over how Lord Ramiel met the Great Wyvern. What was the bargain struck? What did they both agree on? What does the dragon get out of this? Like, what does he have to gain? That kind of thing. And, and, the, and for that matter, where did this army come from? Did they cause the cataclysm and use it as a means to attack the world? Or did the cataclysm summon them up from the bowels of hell itself? It's hard to know. Because they're made of obsidian, were they the predecessors of the Blackstone Legion? Did Apollyon use them as a motivational force for her? Where did the giants go? Where did the great wyverns go? Did they all lose the battle? Why, all the, there are lots of questions. Which makes me think that either A, the story's not yet done, or B, we're going to have to wait until another hero skin to hear more. Not sure. I'm looking forward to hearing more because I feel like there's a lot more that needs to be said. And I think that's my one problem with Lord Ramiel's story. It feels unfinished. I feel like you needed to exposit more in the beginning and then go into the stuff about the ending. All right, so we've done that. Now let's talk about my warden, Ruth. If you were just here to hear about Lord Ramiel, you can leave the video now if you want to. But here I want to talk a little bit about Ruth and compare the two in terms of story. Ruth's story, for those who haven't heard, there's a link in the description where you can go hear her full story. Ruth was a girl born in Valkenheim. She was a Viking-born child. But when her village was destroyed by a knightly force, um, one of the wardens that was there took her under his wing and decided, you know what? She doesn't deserve to die. We'll take her with us until we can find something to work out with her. But over time, she grows attached to him. He grows attached to her. He becomes like a father to her. He starts training her, raising her, teaching her how to read and write. Um, she grows up under him, becoming his uh, page, his squire. And then eventually, um, he wants her, as he gets older, you know what? I want her to have a, life of her have a life of her own, have some independence of her own. And I think the best way to do that is to make her a warden. So he has her take the warden's oath. And in this story, we go over why that's such a big deal. I even go over the ceremony that one goes through to become a warden. I describe how that goes what the oaths are, what she has to swear to. I even go over how she gets her name Ruth because she didn't have a name before. And then after that, um, when her when her father slash mentor dies, she's crushed by it, but is even more determined to prove herself amongst the wardens. But she's not good at it yet because she's still conflicted. Where does she belong? She was born among Vikings. And because she was, a lot of the knights don't treat her right even though, she was a, even though she's a warden now. They mistreat her. They abuse her. They often make sure that she fails in her task, and she's so desperate to prove herself to them that she often rushes into things without thinking and gets hurt, or messes up, or makes a fool of herself. But she also doesn't feel like she belongs among the Vikings because she's grown up now amongst knights, and it would disrespect everything her father was trying to do to make her a warden. So she has no idea what she's meant to do, so she decides, you know what, I need some time to figure out what I'm meant to do. So she leaves Ashfield for a while to go wander on her own to figure out who she is. A big attack from the Vikings comes on a, on a knightly citadel. And when the Iron Legion rushes for the defense, they see that she's already there holding her own against the Viking forces. And when her helmet comes off, the Vikings see that she's of Nordic make, that she is a Viking birth. And they call her a blood traitor. They call her an enemy. They, they insult her. And now she's crushed because she's thinking, man, I've been defied by my, by my own people, defied by the knights. 
I don't know where I'm meant to be, but because she still stood her ground anyway, the Iron Legion then decide to see her as an ally, at least in this circumstance, and work alongside her. And they manage to take the fight to the Vikings and beat them off. Ever since then, her legend's only grown stronger because she now is assured of who she's meant to be, what she's meant to be. She she goes out and she actually takes a fight to the enemy. She protects Ashfeld by going all over the world and fighting future enemies or potential enemies, righting wrongs, that kind of thing. Very heroic stuff, becoming the Lone Knight. Is it a perfect story? No, there are definitely areas that it could be improved on. Like, for example, I think I did more on the establishment of her story and the build-up than I did on the ending like i think i could go into more detail about what she discovered when she was on her own i could go into more detail about how she felt so ostracized what events made her feel ostracized there are areas that i could have improved on but i feel like it was far more important for me to get out how ruth was found what ruth was all about and her taking the warden's oath because in doing so I managed to build on pre-existing lore and pre-existing understanding of how For Honor worked and thus create a character that embodied that. Then from there we can see and guess at some of the things that Ruth would probably do with her time and it opens up the doors to new possibilities that you could see Ruth doing like what would happen in this circumstance, what would Ruth do? Because we have a better understanding of her character and we have an understanding of what she values, we can guess what she would want to do, what she would value, what she would prize, the things that she puts her stock and faith into whereas with Ramiel I think the big problem is we don't know enough about him starting out to even understand why he would make the decision he did I mean yes I want to protect my people and put an end to all war and put down this tyrant so I will drink the blood of this dragon I have to like the dragon should have said I mean you can but you know there's going to be a price and then now we see that he's paying that price by losing his emotions and empathy and he regrets it. He's saying that, man, this stinks. I hate th that it's happened to me. He has to remind himself constantly that he made this choice for the people of people that he doesn't care about anymore. That's tragic, but I would have liked to have seen who he was before he took that sip. I would have liked to have seen who he was before he made that choice. That would have made his choice seem a lot more powerful to me. When I showed Ruth making her decision to stand by the Knights despite the fact that she didn't feel she belonged with them very much, it showed because we saw her character and where she began and why she made this choice, we not only understand why she made that choice, but it makes it more powerful when the Knights decide to work with her at least from my way of thinking whereas with Ramiel he's regretting his decision to take the sip but what kind of person was he before he took that sip I know that the thing describes him as a pious righteous knight but that that's so vague what kind of person was he how much did he care about the people was walking amongst the people regularly something he did regularly if he had a relation with the other factions how did he feel about the other factions and their cultures and their ways? Why didn't they try to emulate his culture and his ways? Why did they follow him? What kind of charismatic leader was he? See, that's the thing. We've got a story about how the cataclysm happened and what part he played in it, but we don't really know who Lord Ramiel is, and I think that's my biggest problem with him. I get it. Cool first warden who made a pact with the first dragon, or the great dragon, or whatever, and fought an army during the cataclysm. That's so cool. Would love to know more about him. Uh, sorry, we're not going to tell you more about him. That's, I think, the biggest problem I have with him. Ruth, meanwhile, while not a perfect story by any stretch, I feel like we know her better. While she doesn't have the big, cool action moment like Ramiel does, I feel like I know who she is more than I know who Ramiel is. But if y'all disagree with me, I fully understand that, and you're free to disagree. Which do you like better? Do you like Ramiel better than Ruth? Let me know in the comments why, please. I'd love to know. Do you like Ruth better than Ramiel? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear why. And yes, at some point I may do a Ramiel versus a Polyon. But honestly, if I did that, it would probably just turn out the same way. I know more about Apollyon based on her actions and her choices than I do about Ramiel because I don't know why he made the actions or choices he does. Apollyon gave a whole speech about why she did what she did. We don't even know what kind of deal was struck between Ramiel and the Great Wyvern. So, again, I can do it, but you can probably guess how it's going to go. Don't get me wrong. Ramiel's story has potential. It's just unfinished. I would love to see it finished. And if you would like, it's up to you, if you would like, I can, if Ubisoft doesn't in this season, I can try to finish it. I would be glad to write how Ramiel met the Great Wyvern. I think that'd be fun. 
But let me know in the comments what y'all think. Again, do you like Ramiel best? Let me know in the comments. Do you like Ruth best? Let me know in the comments. Do you think I should write Ramiel's opening story so that we can kind of see what kind of person he is? Let me know in the comments. Lots of comments to be had, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next video. Take care.